Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris with Sharad Kutin. And today on the show, we have a human rights expert, uh, Philip Alston, here joining us on the show to talk a little bit about uh, poverty in Malaysia and some of the recommendations that you've made after your 11-day visit. Uh, before we go into that, Philip, I do want to ask a bit about uh, some of the policies that we've seen in the past to help uh, people who live below the poverty line or the B40. Uh, cash handouts are... You know, has been part of the Malaysian system for a long time. I think it's become an expectation for many, many years. What do you think about the effectiveness of cash handouts in uh, in combat or in eradicating poverty? I think it depends whether they're uh, intended to eradicate poverty or intended to encourage people to vote. <laughs> um, so, if they're really focused and targeted, they can be very helpful. Um, but the sense that I've got is that the BRIM program, for example, was not particularly well targeted, that there were a lot of wealthy people who were receiving benefits, a lot of very poor people who were not receiving benefits. Uh, so I think that sort of program is very problematic. And it makes it worse in a sense because the government can say, but just a minute, we're spending X billions of ringgits. Mm. You know, what, do you ask, what more are you asking? And the answer is a lot of those billions are not really helping. I do want to ask, though, you know, we had in the BRIM program uh, recipients numbering, in, I think initially in the first iterations, of about um, 8 million and then lower. Now, that's a huge number of people who are getting government help on the basis that they need help or they're, they're vulnerable. Uh, this is the same government that, uh, doesn't, that says that it doesn't have much poverty. So there seems to be a contradiction here. I mean, uh, conceptually, w where's the country to go? I mean, says not, some people need this money, at the same time, only 0.0%, 4% are actually poor. I think the justification that government would put to you is that what we're talking about with the poverty line is people who are really hard up, can't survive on their own. But once we get above that, once you get into the B40 territory, then you've got a lot of vulnerability. And that's true that, you know, if you look at the average savings of, I think, 40, 50 percent of the Malaysian population, uh, they don't have enough to get themselves through retirement or to even cope with a, a sudden disaster, medical or otherwise. So there is a lot of vulnerability, uh, quite apart from people who are actually living in poverty. Right. I want to talk about those uh, portions of the population who are most vulnerable. You know, it really feels like when you talk about poverty, the mainstream narrative is that poverty only affects those <laughs> of, uh, in rural areas, those, you know, in, in indigenous communities, marginalized communities. But I want to talk to you about what you found. So, yes, there are segments of the population that are, you know, significantly impacted through poverty, which, if you could uh, explain to us, what segments these are and also you know in urban poor because there are a lot of Malaysians out there who are struggling to make ends meet at the end of the day yet see the figures on poverty and feel a, a sense of disconnect. Yes, um, so the poor are, it's a very varied group and as you say the difference between urban and rural can be very different. Uh, if you're in a rural area you might be really poor but you've got family you've got community, you've often got food supplies growing somewhere, uh, and there are ways of getting by. If you move that family to the urban areas, it's all gone. No food supplies readily available, no family assistance, community help, and so on. So suddenly they need considerably more money, uh, and the money doesn't go nearly as far. So big differences there. Um, I think it's very hard. It depends really on the situation of individual families, how many children they've got, uh, <clears throat> if there's a single parent involved, particularly a single mother, who are the overwhelming majority of single parents. They're in, always in very difficult situations. Uh, indigenous peoples, particularly in Sabah and Sarawak, right. um, are often uh, not at all well off. Um, you've certainly got, but Malaysians don't count this, uh, the foreign population. Um, but if you've got a population of 32 million or however many, uh, and you then have some estimates go up to 6 million in terms of foreign workers, wow. 
uh, that's documented a, and undocumented. Yes, the two together. That's a huge number. And those people are, by definition, not getting assistance. Uh, and some of them are getting really low wages. They're not getting the minimum wage. They're supposed to, but there's no enforcement at all. And so that adds a lot to poverty. They have a lot of children. Those children are not getting into schools. If you don't get into school in Malaysia, things are grim. If you don't have a, an MIC, a Malaysian Identity Card, uh, all sorts of things are going to be unattainable and poverty is an almost certain uh, element of your future. And let's uh, try and wrap this conversation up. Yeah. If you could help us understand, you know, what you'd like to see come out of this particular report. The, uh, the, the press conference that you had this morning, uh, I believe uh, the story's been picked, taken up in some foreign newspapers as well. So it's gone international. Uh, we have about a minute left. What would you like us to focus on? You've had rec you have recommendations that are fairly general. What is it that you think we need to first do? Okay, so as I said, first recognize that there really is significant poverty and that has to be addressed. Second, be transparent about the statistics. Third, take social protection seriously. That's a sort of life cycle thing from uh, young children who are not fed enough all the way through the elderly, the retired and so on. What's required there is an increase in social spending Malaysian levels of social spending are lower than any of its neighbours uh, in terms of GDP, despite the wealth that's in this country. There's very little money going into social protection. Uh, clearly, taxes could be greatly uh, expanded in terms of collection, not in terms of levels. Uh, there needs to be a much more integrated approach. Uh, departments need to come together. I think what the Deputy Prime Minister is doing, the exercise she's overseeing now, uh, is terrific. I think it has huge potential. I think the government needs to see that an investment in a lot of these different social areas, in treating refugees and their children better, uh, will all be economically beneficial. You will build a better Malaysia. You'll build a more productive Malaysia. There you go. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Philip. That's all the time we have right here on Consider This. Sharad and I will be back with you on Monday. Till then, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. But, uh... <laughs>